Well, good day, everyone. Dr. Flannel is back. It's a cold, snowy day here in Richmond, and I thought I'd take a moment to record another video on ADHD, this being a follow-up to my video a few days ago on why ADHD does not involve hypersensitivity, which is contradictory to the claims made by people like Dr. Gabor Mate in his book Scattered Minds and elsewhere that ADHD is, at its core, a problem with hypersensitivity that then interacts with disrupted, stressed, traumatic, if you will, parenting to lead to ADHD. These videos, this being one of three so far, were designed to contradict and refute that particular idea. So let's get started because today I want to talk about why greater emotionality is not evidence of hypersensitivity in ADHD. Now, I know that doesn't make a lot of sense to you, um, probably seems counterintuitive, and many of you who wrote replies to that last video of a few days ago were confused about, well, if I'm so emotional, doesn't that show hypersensitivity? Well, not quite. And if you come to understand the differences in brain structure and functioning that go with ADHD, I hope that that can help you see why emotionality does not equate with hypersensitivity. So let's take a look at some of the evidence out there on why this is the case. Let me just bring up my browser and we're going to have a look here at some brain images. Now look over here on the right hand side of my screen. Do you see this picture that I'm moving over here? of the brain, right? This is from a study done back in the, I think it was right around 2012 to 2017, no matter. It was done by Philip Shaw and colleagues. It's a multi-site study and it shows the immature brain growth involved in ADHD children who were followed for 10 years. And you can see that the principal delays in brain growth are over the frontal and prefrontal cortex. You can see that on uh, the left and the right hemisphere in these side diagrams. But taking a look at a top-down image, we see this brain difference. So this shows that ADHD is principally a problem with the growth, development, functioning, and connectivity of the frontal cortex with other parts of the brain. Let's take a look at some evidence of brain electrical activity. I use this diagram, again, over here on the right. I used this diagram on my last video to show you that brain electrical activity is diminished in ADHD over the frontal and prefrontal area. Do you see this red area here in the brain for ADHD? That's the right image here in the diagram. So QEEG and EEG brain electrical activity shows a diminished amount of brain wave activity. In other words, higher theta or slow wave activity over the frontal lobe fits with what we saw about brain structure. Now let's have a look at another image. Look over here again on the right hand side. This is a study of functional connectivity how various regions of the brain connect up with each other in performing various tasks. And what it shows principally, and you can see it over here on the far upper right diagram, is there are problems with the frontal lobe's connectivity to other parts of the frontal lobe and especially to structures toward the back of the brain, especially the cerebellum as well. So there's a lot of connectivity problems in ADHD, but many of them appear to originate in that dysfunctional frontal cortex. Now, here's, excuse me, here's another image of the brain. This is from my article in Scientific American, and it shows what this frontal lobe is doing. So Look over here on the right-hand side, and by the way, this image is in Wikipedia as well, and you can see that the frontal cortex is involved in the executive functions, four of which are listed here, and one of those is emotion regulation. So how is it then 
that heightened emotionality is not evidence of hypersensitivity. We can reconcile these two ideas through the following explanation. The frontal lobe is the motor part of the brain. It's where expression is initiated and regulated and self-regulated and controlled. It's where our inhibition is also located. So if there is diminished growth, functioning, activity in the frontal area, it means that there are going to be problems with inhibiting behavior and especially inhibiting the emotional brain, the limbic system. And that is done through the amygdala and other parts of the limbic system. No matter. The point here is that the heightened emotionality seen in ADHD is evidence of poor inhibition of our responding to the world. If you want to think of it this way, you could say that ADHD involves a hyper-reactivity with emotion to the world. But that, even that's not quite right because it's not so much that they're reactive is that they're disinhibited. The emotions are poorly inhibited. So think of it this way. When a provocation occurs, both a typical and an ADHD individual are going to have emotional activation to the provocation. But the typical person is going to suppress that primary strong emotion, downregulate it, self-regulate it, and maybe even try to substitute a competing emotion to help quell the emotion. They may not even show much of the emotion other than signs in their autonomic nervous system, such as through flushing of the face and increased breathing and increased heart rate, all of which indicate an emotional reaction, but the individual isn't demonstrating it. They're inhibiting the motor aspect of their emotions. And that's what ADHD is interfering with. So that the ADHD individual also can be provoked by the same emotional stimulus and have the same sort of initial reaction. But they can't suppress it. They can't downregulate it. They can't self-soothe and self-calm self as well as other people are able to do. And so the emotion comes out quicker, stronger, poorly regulated, and it takes longer to quell that emotion than it does in other people. None of this has to do with the sensory side of the brain, which is largely the posterior part of the two hemispheres. As I showed in my last presentation, there's no evidence that ADHD involves some kind of increased detection and sensation to the environment generally and to stress in particular. And that refutes Gaymor Mate's theory that ADHD involves a hypersensitivity. More accurately, it involves a hyperemotionality that arises from poor inhibition, not hypersensitivity. So I hope that helps you to understand this distinction, as I said, which came up in many replies of people being confused about what's going on here. Well, that's what's going on. And I talked about this, as you can see here, back in 2010 in a review article I wrote that deficient emotional self-regulation was a core feature of ADHD. I brought together all of the literature to argue that the DSM-4 and DSM-5 were wrong in not including poor emotional self-control as a major feature in ADHD, because it is. Even George Still in 1902 argued that it was a central feature in his views of this disorder. I also wrote about this again in my textbook, my ADHD Handbook for Diagnosis and Treatment, where I updated that review paper in 2015 and again argued for the return of emotional dysregulation back into our conceptualization of ADHD. And so it has become. I'm happy to say that now when we look at descriptions written by others, by clinicians, by other researchers and so on about ADHD, they talk about this problem with emotion. And I am thrilled to see that. But in no way 
can we view this as evidence of hypersensitivity? So that said, let's end this presentation. Sorry, I'm clicking on a few buttons here that don't seem to be working very well. We'll get rid of that slide. Thank you. And let me just say then, thank you for engaging the last video so actively. I really appreciate that. I appreciate the comments. I can't respond to all of them, of course. I just don't have the time with so many subscribers, but I do appreciate the comments and the engagement. And I hope that this video helps to clear up some of the confusion I may have created in the last video on why hypersensitivity is not a part of ADHD, which again is why Dr. Matei's theory of ADHD is wrong. Thanks for joining me today. I'll have other commentaries uh, next week. In fact, I'm going to talk about disrupted parenting and why parenting is not a cause of ADHD. That's another critical piece of Dr. Gabor Matei's theory about ADHD. And we're going to gut that idea real quick in my video next week, thereby once again refuting this particular theory about ADHD. Again, thanks for joining me. Live well, be well, and take